Welcome to the deep dive. Ready to explore something pretty fascinating. We're going deep into Canada's changing population today. Sounds intriguing. It is. We're diving into a chapter called Making Connections. It's all about like what's changing with Canada population, why it matters, and what it might even mean for like your future. I like it. Right. So it's going to be a good one. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So the chapter kicks off with this graph showing Canada's population growth rate. And uh, well, let's just say it's been a wild ride. Yeah, it has. I mean, the growth from births and deaths has really plummeted since the 50s, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, no, you're, you're right to focus on that because like for decades, Canada's population, it grew because, you know, families were bigger and health care got a lot better. Right. But recently, that growth from births and deaths, it's, it's really dropped, meaning immigration. Mm -hmm. That plays a much bigger role now. Way bigger. Right. Like. Get this. The chapter actually says that on any given day, more people are added to Canada through immigration than through births. It's true. Wild. Right. It is. And that's actually a perfect example of why we want to be looking at these rates, uh. like birth rates, death rates, immigration rates. They give us a way better picture of how society is changing than just looking at the numbers themselves. You know, For sure. Yeah. And these rates, they have an impact on everything. Think housing markets, job opportunities. Even the types of public services Canada needs to provide. Totally. It's like having a sneak peek into the future, but instead of a crystal ball, we've got, like, demographic data. I like it. Okay, so speaking of the future, the chapter digs into this really cool concept, doubling time, and something called the Rule of 70. Have you heard of this? Oh, yeah, the Rule of 70. It's a really handy way to estimate how long it takes for a population to, well, double. Okay. Well, so basically, you just divide 70 by the population's growth rate, and you get a rough idea of the doubling time. So, like, if a country has a 2% growth rate, it would take, what, like 35 years for their population to double? Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and the chapter, they give these examples of Canada, Japan, and Togo. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it really shows how different these growth rates, what they mean, can be around the world, right? Yeah, for sure. Because Canada's doubling time, it's actually pretty long. It is. But then you've got Japan... And their population growth rate is negative. Yeah, it's actually shrinking. Wow, shrinking. So, like, instead of a doubling time, they're dealing with a uh, what a halving time. Yeah, you could say that. That's that's wild. What kind of what kind of consequences come with a shrinking population? Well, for one thing, it puts a real strain on their social safety net. You know, fewer people working to support a growing older population. Right, right. And then there's the impact on economic innovation, mm. on growth potential. Japan's actually trying all sorts of things to deal with this, from automation to, like, encouraging people to have larger families. Wow, that's interesting. So we've got, like, declining birth rates on the one hand and rising immigration on the other. What's the story there? Like, what's the history behind these trends in Canada? Well, if we go back in time, family sizes in Canada, they used to be much bigger. Oh, yeah, way bigger. The chapter actually mentions that back in the 1850s, the birth rate was more than double what it is today. Double. Yeah. Wow. What caused a change that big? I mean, a lot of things played a role. You had major events like world wars, economic ups and downs, you did things like that. Oh, right. Yeah. Like when the economy is uncertain, people tend to put off having kids. Makes sense. Yeah. Or they have fewer children. Right. Plus, you've got, you know, advancements in healthcare, education, especially for women, which really had an impact on family planning decisions. Yeah, for sure. Makes sense that as those things change, so do families. Exactly. And speaking of big changes, the chapter also mentions that something like 96% of Canadians are either immigrants themselves or descended from immigrants. That's right. That's almost all of us. It is. And it's really important to acknowledge, like the source does, that Indigenous peoples were here long before European settlers arrived. Absolutely. Their history, their presence, it's a crucial part of understanding Canada's demographics. For sure. Okay, so all these immigrants coming to Canada, what were what were some of the big reasons? Like, what drew them here? Well, you've got push factors and you've got pull factors. Okay. Push factors, those are the things that push people out of their home countries, you know, like famine, war, or just a lack of opportunity. Right. A good example, the Irish potato famine back in the 1840s. Imagine your main source of food just gone. Yeah, People had to leave. Many Irish families ended up coming to Canada seeking refuge and new opportunities. Yeah, wow. It's a really powerful example of how, you know, desperate times can drive people to start over somewhere new. Absolutely. So then what about those pull factors? What made Canada seem like a good place to go? 
Well, Canada had, and still has, a lot to offer. Economic opportunities, political stability, mm -hmm. the promise of a better life for their kids. That's always been a big draw. You know, there was even a time when the government was giving away free land in the prairies to encourage people to settle and farm. Free land. Wow. Yeah. That's a pretty good deal. It's amazing how those immigration patterns have changed over time. Like the chapter even has a table showing how the top countries for Canadian immigrants have totally shifted. I mean, it used to be mostly Europe in the early 1900s, but today it's way more diverse, right? Uh, absolutely. We see a lot more immigration now from Asia, Africa, the Caribbean. That's amazing. Yeah. And this shift has really enriched Canada, making us the multicultural society we are today. I totally agree. So we've got all these people coming from all over the world. Where are they choosing to live once they get to Canada? Because it's not like they're all spread out evenly, right? You're right. The chapter points out how immigrants often end up in big urban centers, what we call census metropolitan areas or CMAs. CMAs. Okay. Right. So think like Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal. Mm -hmm. These cities are like magnets for newcomers. What makes those big cities so appealing to immigrants? Well, they usually have more job opportunities, especially in specialized fields. Right. Plus, there are often established cultural communities, which provide a sense of belonging and support for new arrivals. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like coming to a new country and finding a place where you can connect with people who speak your language, who share your customs. Exactly. That's got to be comforting. The chapter actually uses the example of Naranian Plaza mm -hmm. to illustrate this. Imagine you've just arrived and you find this little piece of home thousands of miles away. It's like finding a little piece of home, yeah. It can make a world of difference during a tough transition. Makes sense. But settling in a smaller town or a rural area, that probably comes with its own unique challenges, right? Definitely. I mean, rural areas might offer a quieter life, maybe a lower cost of living, but access to support networks, specialized mm -hmm. services, that can be harder to find. Yeah. And the job market's different too, often smaller, less diverse. So maybe not as many opportunities if you're looking for something specific, right? Right. It can be tough. So we've covered birth rates, immigration patterns, where people are choosing to live. But there's another really important part of this whole population change thing, and it kind of feels like we're looking into the future a bit. The dependency load. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. What is that? So the dependency load basically refers to the ratio of people who aren't working. Usually kids under 15 and seniors over 65 to the people who are working and, you know, contributing to the economy. Okay. And to help explain it, the chapter uses these cool visuals called population pyramids. I like visuals. Yeah, they basically show the breakdown of a population by age and gender all in one neat little chart. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's cool. And the chapter actually encourages us to compare Canada's past, present, and projected population pyramids. And it's really striking. It's like watching a time lapse of Canada's population you know, aging. Aging. Yeah. Canada, like a lot of developed countries, we're seeing this trend of an aging population. Birth rates are down. People are living longer, which means a higher percentage of older adults overall. Hmm. So how does this dependency load thing actually impact, you know, people and the decisions they make? Like, what should our listeners be thinking about given these demographic shifts? Well, it's a really important question. I mean, when you're aware of these demographic trends, it can really help you make informed choices in life. Totally. For example, if you understand that the population's aging, and that means a growing need for healthcare workers, you might think, hey, maybe a career in nursing or geriatric care or social work would be a good fit. Yeah, like having a crystal ball into the future job market. Exactly. Okay, so beyond careers, what else should we be thinking about with this whole dependency load thing? Retirement planning? For sure. Oh, right. And as that ratio of working age people to retirees changes, yeah. there might be some adjustments to things like pensions or oh, Social Security. Right. So it also really highlights how important it is to start saving and investing for retirement early. That's good advice. Okay, before we wrap up, the chapter touches on one more thing, internal migration. So not just people moving to Canada, but people moving within Canada. Mm -hmm. What's the deal with that? Yeah, internal migration is super interesting. You've got people moving between provinces, what we call interprovincial migration. And then there's moving within a province, which is interprovincial migration, often from smaller towns to cities. Right, right. And a lot of times, the reasons behind those moves, they're the same push and pull factors we talked about earlier, you know, like job opportunities, housing costs, access to education, stuff like that. So, like, if someone lives in a province with a struggling economy, they might be drawn to a province where the economy is booming. Exactly. Yeah. And like we said before, those opportunities, they're often concentrated in big urban centers. 
think Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary. These cities are like economic powerhouses, pulling people in from all over. But then doesn't that concentration of people in big cities lead to other issues? Like, doesn't that make housing crazy expensive? Yeah, for sure. When so many people are drawn to urban areas, it can put a real strain on things like housing, transportation, even just resources in general. Makes sense. It really shows how important urban planning is, you know, making sure that cities can handle growth in a way that's sustainable. For sure. Keep those cities livable. Exactly. The chapter also briefly mentions the migration patterns of First Nations, Metis, and Inuit peoples. It's like a whole other layer to this idea of internal migration in Canada. Oh, absolutely. Indigenous communities have their own unique history their own social and economic situations, and all of that shapes how and why they move. Right. So while some Indigenous people might head to cities for school or work, others are actually choosing to go back to their traditional lands. Really? Yeah. They want to revitalize their cultures, their languages. It's really inspiring. That's so cool. It's a good reminder that these statistics, these trends, they're about real people Absolute. with real stories. Each one unique. Okay, so we've covered a lot declining birth rates, the growing role of immigration, doubling time, aging populations, internal migration. It's clear that Canada's population is always changing. It really is. And understanding how and why it's changing is so important for all of us as individuals and as a country. Absolutely. I mean, it affects our economy, our social programs, our cities. It even affects our quality of life. So true. And the chapter wraps up by asking this really thought-provoking question how to profit from the coming demographic shift. And that's something we want you, our listeners, to think about. It really makes you think, right? It does. So does it mean like starting new businesses or changing how we invest our money or maybe even pushing for policies that better support a changing society? I don't know. What do you think? All good questions. Yeah. It's really about connecting the dots, right? Like, yeah. take housing. We know more people are moving to cities. Right. And we know those cities need to be affordable, livable. <laughs> totally. So maybe that means advocating for different housing policies, different approaches to urban planning. Exactly. Or think about health care. With an aging population, well, we're getting more health care workers, but also different kinds of care. Right, like home care, long-term care, things like that. Yeah. So maybe profit. In this case, it's not just about money. Maybe it's about creating a society where everyone can thrive, regardless of age or background. I like that. Profit with a purpose. Exactly. This has been such a fascinating deep dive. I feel like we've just scratched the surface of Canada's changing population, but it's clear that these trends, they have a big impact. They do. They impact our economy, our social systems, our cities, even our own personal decisions. It really makes you think about the future, doesn't it? Like, what will Canada look like in 20 years? In 50 years. Right. What kind of country do we want to leave for the next generation? Big questions. And I think it all comes back to being informed, engaged citizens. Right. right absolutely. Because yeah. when we understand the forces shaping our world, we're better equipped to navigate the future, both individually and as a society. Couldn't agree more. So to our listeners, keep those minds curious and keep exploring these big ideas. Until next time on The Deep Dive.